Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Morality is Hard podcast. Today, we'll be interviewing our guest, Rob Farquharson. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about my motivation for creating this podcast and for the title. Ever since I became interested in philosophy about four years ago, and especially moral philosophy, I've noticed that determining the most ethical course of action in specific real-world situations is actually quite hard. This doesn't seem to reflect in the actions of most people who seem to assume that it's really quite easy. I'm not sure why this is. Maybe they like to believe that it's easy to be a good person. Uh, But in any case, morality is not as simple as you want it to be. Let's give some real-world examples. The Scared Straight program gets a lot of negative press, but I'll uh, I'll just <laughs> I'll add to that press here. In short, it's a US program that takes teenage delinquents into prison where they are intimidated for three hours in the hopes that it will scare them out of performing crime in the future. Unfortunately, this program actually increases crime rate amongst these children. So in other words, the children going into this program are worse than the children who didn't, and the world would be a better place without this program. This seemed like a good idea, but ultimately wasn't. And this isn't the only example of a well-meaning act going wrong, and it highlights the importance of thinking carefully about the impact of our actions, and combining that with rigorous data collection and analysis. Many people assume that assisting people out of poverty is a good thing, and it almost always is, at least for the humans, but what we have to keep in mind is that as a society gets more wealthy, it consumes more meat, which leads to more animal suffering. This is partly why we see meat consumption rising in China, for example. This is sometimes referred to as the rich meat eater problem or the poor meat eater problem. And so uh, if we're interested in the well-being of all sentient creatures, humans and non-humans alike, simply focusing on poverty alone isn't necessarily a good thing. This is just one example of how future effects of an action can outweigh the present day effects. And the effects range from... I mean, tomorrow to one week down the track to what could happen even thousands or millions or trillions of years from now. Nick Beckstead argues that most of the value, most of the moral value of anything we do today, whether positive or negative, lies in the far future. Uh, we're talking many years from now and, and then down the track. And, and so therefore, we must consider the far future when we make major actions or decisions. There is There is the immediate value that we see right now and in the present and in um, in the, the weeks, months, years um, from now. But we really should be considering what happens over the course of the universe as the, as the result of a single action. A lot of this comes down really to which ethical framework you take. For example, you have deontologists who determine the best course of action based on rules. For example, don't kill, don't lie. Uh, and act utilitarians, uh, as another example, who are interested in reducing the amount of suffering in the world and in increasing the amount of happiness in the world. For an act utilitarian, the action that most minimizes suffering and most maximizes happiness is the best one. There are other ethical frameworks, and each one is capable of coming up with a different answer for the question of what we ought to do with the same situation. This fact alone makes morality hard. How do we know what framework to accept? Most people seem to assume that their chosen framework is correct and act accordingly. I myself have switched from deontology to utilitarianism about four years ago, and you'll see that I apply utilitarianism throughout this podcast and my other work. An example of where this framework comes into play, let's suppose you have, uh, let's suppose you think non-human animals have some moral value. Perhaps you would adopt a vegan lifestyle and then do your best to not consume animal products, which would lead to their suffering. A deontologist and utilitarian would agree that uh, it's wrong to eat animals today. Fine. But add another layer. By making a modest donation to an effective animal charity of, say, $20, you could spare potentially dozens of animals from factory farming through one of the most effective animal charities today. That's huge. That's probably more animals than you would kill if you're an omnivore, eating an omnivorous diet for a year. The implication of this is that if you spent $25 on a vegan meal at a restaurant when you could have eaten at home for $5, the effect of your action, the the net effect of your action is that dozens of animals that could have been spared have otherwise suffered. A utilitarian would look at this based on the consequences of the action and say, uh, this is probably a wrong choice or that at least there was a better choice that could be made here. However, 
a deontologist would see nothing wrong with this act, with the act of spending $25 in a meal when you could have donated $20, even for $5, and saved, spared dozens of animals from, from a life of hardship. A deontologist wouldn't necessarily see that as a bad thing. They have not directly taken part in the killing of those animals that they could have saved, and therefore they would say that they are blameless. It seems that much disagreement about what we should do falls into the category of disagreement of moral framework rather than actual factual disagreement of the effect of uh, actions. Yet, this is very rarely acknowledged in debate. When people hold different frameworks, they will inevitably disagree on a number of things on the question of what we ought to do. But people will argue back and forth about some point without really acknowledging the fact that they are just coming at it from different frameworks and they are, of course, going to come up with different answers. So today, as I said, I spoke with uh, my guest, Rob Farquharson, and we had a great discussion about a lot of topics from, um, from you know, platforming to artificial intelligence to wild animal suffering. And I really think you enjoy our chat. So without any further ado, my guest, Rob Farquharson. Rob Farquharson is a MPhil candidate in philosophy at the University of Adelaide, Australia, where he is studying the philosophical foundation of cognitive science with a focus on real world examples. His current case study is on the homing behavior of desert ants. He is also an undergraduate tutor and he has a keen interest in moral philosophy. Rob, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Michael. It's a pleasure. We're going to focus um, on a range of topics today, but I was wondering if you could just quickly take a few minutes to break down the research that you do in your day job for us. So what is your main focus and what are your key findings so far? Right, so uh, the, the big picture of my research is, is studying the relationship between the mind and brain. Um, so how is it that uh, if, you're, if you're a naturalist like me, um, you think that the, the mind is somehow reducible to, to brain states uh, and we just want to analyze uh, what in particular is it about brain states that um, gives rise to particular mental states. Um, and so the, um, as you said, my case study is looking at um, desert ant behavior. But um, so what I do is look at artificial neural network models um, that uh, we think can explain how ants can do some uh, cognitive processes and compute um, some particular, uh, actually quite sophisticated mathematical functions in order to successfully behave in their environment. So these, these desert ants um, uh, are really quite neat. They, they make these great circuitous um, journeys out to look for food. Uh, and these ants are solitary uh, foragers, so they go out by themselves uh, and then after they've walked around basically randomly, and once they find food, instead of following their path back home, they actually just make a beeline, you know, straight line path back to their nest. Um, so that's a really neat um, behavior, actually, for such a, what seems like such a simple creature that actually involves some really sophisticated computations. No, they're not. Um, they're not using pheromones or lands landmarks to get back to their nest. They're actually there's something. There's definitely something going on there in terms of computation. Yeah, that's right. We think we think this is uh, the desert ants are really hot at the moment in the philosophical literature because we really think it is uh, this paradigmatic uh, case of uh, internal representations and internal computations going on because the um, the desert floor where they live um, is is basically barren. Um, so it looks the same in every direction for as far as you can see. So there are no really distinguishable landmarks for them to use. So they can't register uh, and memorize, okay, this landmark means I'm this far away from my nest and in this direction. Um, so they can't do that. But then also it's um, windy. So um, because the, 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 it's also featureless, um, any sort of pheromone trail that they would leave um, would just get blown away. So they can't, uh, they can't use that either. Fascinating. So we'll come back to the, um, the topic of computation a little bit later when we talk about uh, in an artificial intelligence uh, context. But uh, now I just want to talk a little bit about a, a recent event involving Ayan Hirsi Ali and her planned visit to Australia. Ayan Hirsi Ali was born in Somalia as a Muslim. She was a victim of female genital mutilation at the age of five and moved to the Netherlands in 1992 to escape an arranged marriage. Yeah, after 9-11, she renounced Islam and eventually became a well-known critic of the religion. Around this time, she started to receive death threats for that same criticism. She had a brief political career, and in 2004, she collaborated on a short film 
called Submission with Theo Van Gogh, the grandson of artist Vincent Van Gogh. Um, and this film criticised the treatment of women in Islamic society. Vincent was uh, later was murdered later that year for his part in the film, and Ayan later fled to USA, where she continues her criticism of treatment of the treatment of women in Islam. Ayan is often called a bigot and an Islamophobic for these views. So what's happened recently? Ayan was um, on track to visit Australia for a speaking tour this week. Um, we're recording this on the uh, 6th of April, 2017, and um, she had to cancel her trip. And I guess the details are still a little bit murky, but it seems for two reasons. One is um, because her visit was being opposed by um, by the public in general, it seems, but or at least a large, num- a large amount of the public. But in particular, there was a, a Muslim women's group um, opposing her visit, uh, calling her a bigot and Islamophobic, um, a Promoting promoting hate speech, um, and also there were security concerns, which we can only assume were maybe related to this, and um, perhaps threats around her life. So of course she does receive a number of death threats. Um, now, uh, I guess you would call this a, a form of no platforming. Um, and Rob, I'm just curious to um, get your thoughts on this. I think it is uh, a bit unfortunate that she's um, had to cancel the trip. But um, yeah, there is a delicate line that we have to walk, I guess, uh, on this sensitive issue of free speech and, uh, but also securing the rights and uh, safety of minority groups who who uh, may be maligned in the in the general community. Um, so that's often the most important thing to realise is that there there actually are genuine bigots out there that. Um, actually can't take the nuanced point that um, a criticism of Islam as a doctrine doesn't necessarily mean that all Muslims are bad. Um, And that leads people that are well-intended, I think, to then go on this uh, crusade to try and no-platform people like Ayan Hirsi Ali because they're afraid of the real bigots um, essentially getting ammunition for their bigotry from... uh, the kinds of things that Ayan Hirsi Ali would like to say. But I think we just, we really have to push back and say, um, we have to make the nuanced argument because there really is uh, something to be said, or at least there seems to be uh, a genuine argument that needs to be had, a discussion that needs to be had um, in the public discourse about the the, the link between religion and uh, behaviours. So, um, yeah, this just goes back to really traditional liberal values of, of free speech, though. And I think J.S. Mill uh, really set it out in a, in a nice way when he said, OK, maybe we don't need freedom of expression uh, everywhere, but there needs to be maybe one space, at least one space, uh, where the public can come together and really just go at it with no uh, no no worries for of, of reprisal um, or of being shut down. And he thinks um, this doesn't just secure a a civil society, but he just thinks this is actually basically a a kind of peer review for your beliefs. Um, So, you know, we think uh, if we're all empiricists, we think peer review is a great thing. Um, So we think J.S. Mill basically says we should basically put all of our political ideas uh, to the same kind of test. Um, And having this this open space um, for the public to come together and debate um, really sensitive issues, like uh, like the issue of Islam at the moment, um, is basically a space where you can get up and test your beliefs. Because he thinks if you, if you don't continually test your beliefs and survive, uh, get your beliefs to survive this peer review process, then basically, how do you distinguish between a belief that you hold that is well justified and a belief that's just dogma, that's just being belted into you on mother's knee? Uh, and he thinks this is a really important thing to do. He's, of course, an Enlightenment thinker. Uh, he wants to um, he wants to propose that everybody should be empirical, uh, follow an, an empiricist kind of epistemology, uh, a, a empirical route to knowledge. So, um, if you're not testing all of your beliefs, then you're engaging in in dogmatic uh, beliefs, uh, holding dogmatic beliefs, and that's just antithetical to the entire sort of empirical project. Mm, um, no platforming really seems to be um, kind of counterproductive, I guess, to to fight like truth finding 
um, finding finding what is the what is the best claim. It, and I think it's actually quite overconfident. Um, so I, the, of course I've made this podcast because I think um, moral issues are actually much more complex than people think they are, and people are too often overconfident about um, what they think is the correct moral course of action. And um, if you if you know platform um, someone who holds a different idea to you, then you're missing out on the opportunity to change your mind. And, and not only that, you might be just misrep- you might be misinterpreting their views and not giving them the chance to actually um, to actually talk about their views just because they they've decided to tackle a, a difficult topic. I do think it's a shame because really what Ayana is doing is she's advocating for the rights of women in Muslim societies. She um, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that there are there are some um, some society some Muslim societies where women are just objectively treated badly. Um, and I guess we could um, there's a lot of examples of of how women are being treated in Muslim societies that we would say are objectively bad. That um, that is not how uh, not how women should be treated. So this is all she's doing. She's talking about um, she's talking about the the treatment of uh, women and saying that they should be treated better. And she's called a bigot and Islamophobic for that, which I think is um, I, I think that's a, I think that's a shame. Um, another another similar event unfolded um, at the University of Victoria in Canada. So Peter Singer, who is an Australian moral philosopher and well known as the um, founder of the Effective Altruism Movement, which just briefly is about, uh, it's a relatively new movement of using evidence and reason uh, and rationality to try and find the most effective ways of improving the world and then acting on those. Uh, And also he um, is one of the founders of the Animal Liberation Movement. Um, He was giving, so there there was a presentation of his um, of his TED talk about effective altruism to a local chapter of effective altruism at the University of Victoria, which would then have been was then going to be followed by a Skype question and answer session. And disability right protesters entered the room and uh, began to drown out the, the the TED talk and then his Q and A by making a lot of noise. Um, so I guess this is a, another example of no platforming, and uh, I, I do think. So Peter Singer um, has some views on uh, abortion and infanticide, um, which, in my opinion, are almost always misrepresented. Um, And so these protesters were claiming that someone who promotes ableism and hate speech was not welcome to speak about any topic, uh, including effective altruism um, at the University of Victoria. And just to to really briefly lay out his views on uh, on abortion and infanticide, um, of course, Keep in mind, I'm not Peter Singer. This is very much a secondhand account based on what I've heard. Um, I've heard him say on uh, TV. Really, his case is simply just: if uh, if a child is born that is so severely disabled that they're going to have a very negative quality of life, um, such that the, 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 the child's quality of life and the quality of life of those around them is going to be severely negatively affected. Um, the parents of the child should be able to have a, a well-informed and rational discussion with their doctor about options and um, implications. And if the doctor uh, does suggest that maybe it is better if this um, uh, either unborn child is terminated or this born child is um, is killed, then maybe that should be an option. He's not. He's definitely not advocating for for all uh, disabled people to be killed, which is what some people like to like to claim that he is saying. Um, and I, I find that I find it hard to believe that uh, advocating for a, a well-reasoned and informed discussion, an open discussion about this, is is the same as hate speech. Um, but I think this is just another example of how uh, no platforming can be kind of kind of productive. And just I'll get, quickly get your thoughts on this event in particular. Yeah, so I think it's basically another example of the same phenomenon um, that we were just talking about before. Uh, it's really unfortunate because, yeah, I think you're right. His views do get uh, grossly misrepresented. And going to see him talk was a perfect opportunity for those people to um, uh, hear what he really had to say and, and, and quiz him on it. If they thought he was wrong, they had he was right there on Skype and he could have been pushed on his beliefs. And uh, if they were so confident in, in their uh, moral stances, then really they should have the argument to back it up. And Peter Singer is a, you know, a philosophy professor. He, he would definitely admit that if you've got a strong rational case or evidence-based case uh, to suggest something, then he would absolutely want to change his mind. And that, I think, is uh, a crucial 
crucial point to be raised, particularly in the way that political discourse and moral discourse is going on at the moment. Uh, when you when you find people, you need to ask them even before you bother engaging in a in a moral disagreement. Uh, you need to ask them. Are you willing to change your mind and what evidence or uh, reason could I give that would potentially uh, change your mind? And basically, if they admit that there's nothing that could change their mind, there's no possible way the universe could be uh, organized uh, that would force them to change their beliefs, then you're, you're in trouble, basically. Mm. And that's basically treating morality politics as a as a sport, as a game, basically. You're picking a side and you're just rooting for them to win because um, you like that ideology, you like that team. But if we're really interested in consequences, right, so uh, this is going to come up a lot, I guess. Uh, our, our presuppositions, uh, Michael, are, we are both consequentialists of, of one sort or another. So if we're really concerned about the consequences and making the world a better place, um, then there you really should have some kind of doxastic openness or aperture you, your beliefs what that means is just that your beliefs should be open to revision um, so if there's another way to do or achieve the thing that you want to achieve you need to be open to that um, so I don't think really these protesters want a different thing than Peter Singer uh, I really don't think their um, values are, are not aligned but I think we, they're really disagreeing on methodology and how to get there uh, and if that's the case, then, yeah, you should be open to evidence and revision. So moving on to our next topic, I uh, want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and the safety and ethical concerns there. We've spoken about this before, and I know we have, um, we've had a few dis minor disagreements in the past. Just I'll quickly lay out um, the case about AI safety, uh, and then you can um, talk about the points that you, that you disagree with. So... Um, the, the notion behind being concerned about artificial intelligence is um, is that we're improving the um, capability of computers uh, and um, computation all the time. And uh, as, as people like Nick Bostrom say, who wrote the great book Superintelligence, which is a good introduction to this topic, he says, um, eventually we'll get to some point where the artificial intelligence is able to improve itself. Uh, and not only that, to improve itself um, better, more efficiently, and faster than a human can, uh, and it might hit, reach uh, a kind of a runaway point called um, a, a hard takeoff, where it improves itself so fast that we're not able to control it, and it might actually do something that we don't want it to do. So there are two two distinct problems here. One is the values alignment problem, and that is um, even if uh, um, even if you made an AI a safe AI, um, how can you be sure that it has the same values as you? How can you be sure actually that you have the right values in the first place? And how can you be sure that um, the when you input the values into the AI, whether you do that by instructions or so on, how can you be sure that the AI has interpreted that in the way, not, not only the way that you've coded that, but the way that you meant it? And so an example of this is, if I was to say to an AI, um, make or the, uh, make everyone happy in the world or eliminate all suffering in the world. Um, seems like a reasonable thing to do, but the AI may work out the most efficient way to do this is to kill all life on Earth, and that will eliminate all the suffering. It's followed the instructions, but it's not quite what we meant. Um, AI will, um, programs, of course, being very good at following instructions. Um, now, the, another, another example might be, um, <clears throat> if you say, uh, make me happy, it might work out the best way to do this is to just strap you down and inject dopamine into your brain uh, once an hour or something. So it's, it's following the instructions, but it's um, it's not quite doing what we meant. And also, um, just being sure that an AI has even the same ethical values as us and being sure that we have the right ethical values. The other problem is the control problem. And this is just um, <clears throat> if there was an AI that did uh, have some kind of negative properties. It was doing something bad about the world that we didn't like, or it was, or it was likely to. Um, how can we, how can we control that such that uh, we can detect that it's going to do that and stop it from doing that in time? And so this is what the, these are the two problems the AI safety community are working on. Um, they're trying to, uh, they're trying to solve these problems before 
artificial intelligence is even capable of getting to that level. So you might think, well, why are we worrying about this now? Artificial intelligence is still decades off of um, being a problem. But by the time it's a problem, it's too late. So we have to we have to solve the control problem and the um, the values alignment problem well before artificial intelligence gets anywhere near that hard takeoff level. So that's what people like Nick Bostrom are doing. Um, the what the future of humanity and machine intelligence research institute are working on. They're trying to solve these problems um, well in advance of us actually needing them. And so, I mean, this. Artificial intelligence gone wrong could have some far-reaching implications. It could, um, I mean, even if you think these cases are unlikely, the implications are so great that you should probably at least consider them. For example, uh, it could wipe out all life on Earth, and that's robbing future life of um, all its all its happiness and joy that it might be experiencing. It might just make um, it might just create a lot of suffering in the world today and and going forward. Now, that's kind of the the basic case for AI. Um, and now I'll just throw it over to you to um, talk about any of the any of the um, definitions or points that you disagree with. I, I like the way that um, Sam Harris sets out this problem. Um, so, in his recent TED talk, he 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 talked about this using just three premises. So, first of all, um, intelligence is just a matter of information processing in physical systems. Two, we will continue to improve our information processing machines. And three, we stand nowhere near the summit of intelligence. So more or less, those are his three premises about the problem involved in uh, AI safety. And just from the start, I can I can get on board with two and three immediately. But my problem um, is with the first premise. Um, so, so what I really want to um, try and tease apart is this first premise that information processing um, is all that uh, intelligence entails or all that intelligence is. So um, I know this sounds like a really pedantic uh, philosophical quibble, but I think it's a really important distinction and it will have um, consequences um, for the way that we think about our uh, robots and, and computers and these sorts of things in the future. So I'm, I'm not quibbling about whether or not um, these machines can be dangerous, right? So, so just like hammers and missiles can be dangerous, um, to various extents, you know, a missile is obviously more dangerous than a hammer. Um, I think I think our information processing machines can still be dangerous in that manner. But what I'm worried about is just um, the the consequences of calling them intelligent, and uh, that will also have some more technical problems about the the particular risks involved if they're not intelligent. I think that might have some flow on effects for whether or not there really is a hard takeoff problem. But um, it's mostly just about. So you're you're saying um, your your uh, disagreement is that they won't necessarily be sentient, or that they won't be sentient. If you put it in lay terms. Well, well but, but, but sentient is just another layer of philosophical weed. Sentience? Do you mean conscious? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that 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 might be another layer. We, we the, the hard problem. Let's not even go there. At the very minimum. So in the hierarchy of philosophical thought, it's like intelligent things and then above intelligent things conscious things but consciousness need not necessarily come along for the ride in an intelligent system right but so so to, to be sentient and conscious you necessarily have to be intelligent but if you're intelligent you need not necessarily be conscious so that's why i think that there's that, that distinction as well and that's why sam harris introduces it as intelligence is what information processing is not consciousness because consciousness is, we run into the hard problem of consciousness, right? And that's just, we're, we're never going to solve that, right? Okay, so tell us why you think um, you, you have this disagreement with Sam Harris's first point. Right, because intelligence has those, the way we think about intelligence will have those flow on effects. So it'll have ethical consequences. Because if, if we really think these machines are, are intelligent, I mean, there's a group, I think, down at Monash University who already think you know, shutting down your laptop could be um, a morally incorrect thing to do because you're basically killing an intelligent system um, every time you turn it off, right? So there, there are flow on effects. You know, if we think um, you only get moral, um, you get moral consideration in virtue of your, you know, well-being and intelligence. If you think a computer is intelligent, then you have to include computers in your moral circle. Mm. And um, Brian, Brian so Tomasic's another, another um, advocate of that argument as well. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, so I think it's important um, about really getting um, really getting sure on what we mean by intelligent and and how we can physically implement intelligence you know, in, in a physical system. Yeah. So it's not that they, yeah, again, the problem is not that they, these machines could be dangerous, okay? But, but just like any other, a car is dangerous, right? If, if you're really irresponsible with a car, that could be super dangerous. Um, but the, the car isn't intelligent. We're not worried about cars, uh, you know, having the, uh, this hard takeoff problem with cars where they're just going to start improving themselves and they're going to become transformers or something like that, right? And we also we don't worry about slamming the door shut too hard, you know. So that's the, that's the distinction that I want to make. So historically, the the, the debate was um, really pivotal in setting up cognitive science in the first place as a distinct, independent area of science, right? Apart from the the purely physical or biological sciences. So, what is it about information processing that gives us cognition? That's what I really want to tease apart right so i'll just describe like a bit of a hierarchy first and then i'll sort of try and lead you down um each step so at the very top of the hierarchy we think there's intelligence right there's this there's this really um important thing in the world that we need to explain intelligence that's that's different to everything else in the world there are, there are intelligent things there are non-intelligent things below that level of intelligence we explain intelligence in terms of information processing and then we explain information processing in terms of computation, and then how we explain computation, uh, which often gets forgotten in the sort of um, mainstream dialogue about computation, is that representation is actually super important for computation. All right, so that's the hierarchy that you should just keep in your mind, and then we'll we'll go through and talk talk about that. So again, th there seems to be a meaningful divide between things in the world that are intelligent, things that aren't. Right, a rock is definitely not intelligent. A cat is definitely intelligent, right? But if we're all naturalists or materialists of some sort, we have to give a non-mysterious way of explaining that difference, right? Um, so that naturalism just means no spooky stuff. So no Cartesian dualism, there's no soul, there's no ghost in the machine, okay? And that, that's where information processing gets a shoe on the door, okay? So information processing gives us this purely physical way of, of explaining intelligence. The, the problem in a nutshell, okay, for thinking about intelligence as information processing is, is intelligence a functional kind or is there something special about the process itself? So what I mean by that is, is something intelligent merely in virtue of what it does or is there something special about how it achieves what it does that makes it intelligent, okay? So an AI yeah. could do this exactly the same thing as a human, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, uh, intelligent or conscious if it's doing it in some um, right. some relevantly exactly. different way. Yeah, that's right. So so there's a relevant difference in in how the process gets to be successful. So so like my phone is already superhuman at doing arithmetic and mathematics, right? but I don't think it actually knows anything about the laws of mathematics. It's not, it's not really intelligent, okay? But so, and that, that's the way that digital computation works in a nutshell, right? I could, I could set up a system that is it's just a box, and inside the box is just a series of dominoes, and I could, I could arrange them in a really fancy and clever way so that when you give it input, the dominoes fall and give you an output and say the input was one plus one and then I could make these dominoes fall over that gives an answer to be two right nobody thinks dominoes falling over there's nothing intelligent about that process okay so that's the that's the that's the difference in a nutshell is intelligence merely this mapping between input output or is there something um, special about how that process gets you from input to output. That is the hallmark of intelligence, okay? So let, let, let's tease that, that distinction out more, okay? So the, like I said, there's, there's this rational relationship between the physical states inside my head and what they result in, okay? So hunger equals food, you know, thirst equals water. 
Okay. But then there's also that plasticity. So if I, um, so if I went to the kitchen and found um, that there's no food in there, I don't just go through the motions of eating imaginary food, right? I go to the shop or whatever, right? I, I adapt my behavior so as to render it appropriate to the conditions that obtain in my environment. Okay, so that that's really the crux of intelligence. But an AI would do that as well. An AI is not going to continue on with some task if it's gotten some input that tells it it should stop. Right. So but, what, what's the difference then? Right, in, in how you get a system to render its behavior appropriate. Okay, so that's the sort of behavioral hallmark that we can just, that, that lets us split the world between things that are intelligent, things that aren't. So all the things that you think are intelligent have to do this kind of thing, right? But then we run into this problem of how do you encode information about states of the world, about states of your own body into just purely physical states that you can then operate on those states, process or decode them. And then that decoding process gives you the right kind of output depending on what kind of encoded state you put into it in the first place, okay? Hmm. So that's why information processing is, 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 is the phrase that we use to talk about intelligence, because it seems that, that, that seems like a perfectly um, non-mysterious way to get that behavioral appropriateness. Encode information into a physical state, design some infrastructure to operate on that physical state, decode it, and then you get behavior, okay? And that, that's exactly what a computer does, right? You just set up some finite states to act as symbols and then design some machine infrastructure to act on those symbols. Okay? So then at the very bottom of digital computation, all we have are voltage gates, you know, on, off. So if, if, if the conductance is above a certain threshold, it's on. And if not, it's off. Okay? So two states that act as symbols. And then you just arrange a bunch of these gates in a really clever way. And then depending on what symbols you give it as input, it'll operate on those symbols and give you the correct kind of output, okay? Okay, but it, someone might be, some one of our listeners might be asking, um, the human brain seems to do something um, reasonably similar. It's, it's, far, it's got neurons firing and it's doing some computational work. So tell us why that's, why is that different then to a computer? Well, where this gets philosophically tricky if it wasn't already, is that now we've opened the door to this notion of representation at the bottom of the hierarchy that I mentioned at the very beginning, okay? So now we've, we're talking about computation, which seems like a good way to do information processing, which seems like a good way to explain intelligence, right? But now what we can see is that, why, what is it about computation that makes it work, okay? It's because the symbols are actually supposed to encode something, okay? They're, a, they're about something else. And that's why they successfully lead the computer to give you the correct input. Okay, but then this, this notion of being about something is where the philosophy of computation comes in. How do, how do symbols get to be about the things they're supposed to be standing in for? Okay, so in philosophy, we just call that the content determination problem, but you know, wh whatever. So what they're about is their representational content. But so, yeah, again, how do symbols get their representational content? Well, symbols don't have content in and of themselves, okay? Symbols are arbitrary. You can use anything as a symbol, but what's more important is that there is a system of conventions or a set of rules in place um, that let the system know how to react to um, whatever physical variables you're deciding to use as a symbol, okay? So natural language, there's nothing about the, le the shape of the letter T that makes it a letter T. Uh, it it's the rules about English that make it the letter T, right? And similarly, with digital computation, voltage gates, um, you know, like I said before, it's just um, electric electrical conductance on off, and then the voltage gates embody their rules, quote unquote, by just being sensitive to that conductance, okay? But they never really follow rules, if you know what I mean. The rules are just built into the physics of the system, okay? But so this is where it's really important to plant a flag in the philosophy. 
the role of representation in digital computation is not in the things being processed themselves, but actually in the design or the architecture of the machine infrastructure that's processing over them. So once we realize, okay, that, that symbols have no content in and of themselves, and they're only, they only get to be about something in virtue of having a cleverly designed system to, to manipulate them, we have, a, we have a problem, okay? Because it undermines the very project that we set out to solve in the first place. Intelligent systems were supposed to render their behavior appropriate to the environment because of the content of their internal states, okay? It was supposed to be because my internal state was about hunger and then there's a rational relationship between hunger and food, another representation, I represent that there's food in my kitchen, that I go to the kitchen, right? It was supposed to be because of that content that I go to the kitchen. But digital computations and symbols have no internal intrinsic content, okay? So now we have an explanation for, the, for a problem that eliminates the, the problem in the first place. It, it sweeps it under the carpet. So uh, an easy way to think about this, this difference between analog and digital um, computation is, for example, the Chinese room experiment uh, developed by John Searle. So basically the, the thought experiment is you've got a, a person, a human in a room, uh, and they have no way to interact with the outside world except for these uh, two sort of shoots, um, openings in the walls. One's an input shoot and one's an output shoot. Uh, and sitting um, next to this person is a book uh, with a set of rules in it and a whole stack of pieces of paper that have like squiggly symbols on it. Um, every now and then a symbol comes in, a bunch of squiggles on a piece of paper, comes in from the input shoot. The person looks at the symbol, finds it in his book, and then the book says, if you see this symbol, then push uh, this other symbol out the output shoot. And so the person just keeps running through this process um, over and over again, sees the symbol, uh, looks it up in the book, and then gives the appropriate symbol uh, back out. And unbeknownst to the person inside the room, they're actually having a conversation in Chinese uh, with the people outside. The squiggles on a piece of paper uh, are actually Chinese um, pictographs. And, and um, every time they, uh, they've received a, a symbol, the book has been so well designed that um, they're giving perfect responses um, to, these, to these questions that have been posed to it. So um, the crucial thing to realize now in this uh, thought experiment is, is rule following enough to give you uh, understanding or semantics? Um, and so, but to, just to tweak that back into talk about um, um, intelligence, can we really think that this process of just rule following, looking up a book, is that really a smart process? Or can that be completely, um, can we replace that person with a completely brute physical system uh, and get that process to be basically autonomous, but nonetheless, it's still just doing this really unintelligent process of following rules. It doesn't seem like rule following is, is the same or has the same depth as genuinely understanding the symbols uh, that are coming in in Chinese. There seems to be something uh, more to actually being sensitive to the content within the, the Chinese symbols. So that's how we put it in the sort of philosophical jargon. Digital systems just being um, rule following systems then um, aren't sensitive to content. And then what that does is mean that it doesn't give you that causation by content that we thought computation um, was going to allow us to do. So if we can't get that causation by content, which we thought was what gave us this whole mark of intelligence, right? Behavioral appropriateness, 
then digital computation isn't really a good framework for, for thinking about intelligence. And maybe we should think about this other way of doing computation um, so that we can really get um, causation by content inside the system itself. There is another way of getting a physical state to be about something. Rather than by a convention, it can intrinsically be about something by resembling it, e.g. a map. There's an alternative theory to computation. There's another way of getting a physical state to be about something. And I've got some links that we can put up that uh, demonstrate what I mean by that. It's a little bit too long to go into, but... Okay, we'll put that uh, on the website. I I do wonder if this question of whether... Um, if, if, it, if artificial intelligence is necessarily intelligent, conscious, whatever, however you want to call it, um, I, I get it's relevant in some cases, but... It's also a little bit of a distraction, and I'll, here's why. Um, it's relevant if we are thinking about whether to give moral um, moral importance to artificial systems, to, um, say, a laptop. So uh, Brian Tomasic thinks there's a chance that um, video game characters are sentient, if I'm not misrepresenting his views. Um, and then the, a, a softer version of that is eventually we have an artificial intelligence system intelligent enough or uh, computationally strong enough, it will be sentient. And so if that is the case, then, um, then I guess killing an artificial intelligence system might be just as bad as killing a human, say. Um, so it's relevant in that sense. But exactly. where, I don't, where I think it's a distraction is... So I, I just just yesterday I was listening to the Skeptics Guide to the Universe podcast and they were talking about exactly this. Um, so one of them said they think artificial intelligence is a concern. You know, it's, um, we're going to get to a takeoff scenario eventually, um, and if we don't have the control problem sorted out by then, then we're going to be in trouble. And the other the other hosts all said, oh no no no, because it's not it's not going to be sentient or like um, we don't have to inbuild. We don't have to input um, self-awareness into the AI for it to operate and do what we want it to do. That is a distraction. Because, that is a red herring. I agree. Yeah. So it's it's relevant for for moral moral importance of the AI itself, but um, the safety can, there's still safety concerns. It, an AI can be totally not self-aware and still be a threat to life. An asteroid is not self-aware, but that is still a threat to life. It doesn't matter that it's not self-aware but that's that's just where i want to rein that in but it sounds like you agree with that anyway so i agree that that's a red herring you don't have to be conscious to be dangerous and you don't have to be conscious to be intelligent so are there any other implications um of this that i might have missed that you want to cover i mean this this will be a little bit too technical to get into today but but i think there will be consequences for whether or not there will be a, a kind of hard takeoff scenario okay because if, if this kind of symbol manipulation uh, process isn't truly intelligent they um, it doesn't matter how sophisticated you make that system it'll never really achieve something like general intelligence because of what I think goes into uh, making general intelligence right which it, it's just too much for today but so I think there will be some other kinds of safety implications but yeah, I, don't, I just don't think we'll be able to get into it today. One one issue discussed in Superintelligence, Nick Bostrom's book, um, which is a good introduction to this topic, uh, by the way, uh, of AI safety, AI safety and concern in general. Um, one one issue or one potential th future threat they discuss in that book is uh, I can't remember exactly what terminology he used, but something like holding an, an artificial system holding humans hostage by basically simulating. Uh, another AI that it's in control of and saying to humans something like um, this this uh, subsystem I've just developed is worth the consciousness of um, you know a human and basically I'm going to torture this human um, for forever until um, I'm, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in so much pain this artificial system until you give me what I want and then humans and then you know if they say no then the artificial intelligence would just say oh okay well now I'm now I'm torturing a thousand people I suppose this is maybe a Pascal's mugging, but um, if AI is not sentient or intelligent, this isn't an issue. The AI can say that all at once, but if we know that it's not sentient, then that'll never never be an issue. So, they, um, yeah, maybe maybe you should uh, write a footnote for super intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I'd love to. <laughs> so, moving on to our next topic, this is um, something I became interested in and only found out 
I only really found out about last year, about mid last year. Um, but it's something I've since become quite worried about. And that's the um, the topic of wild animal suffering. Now, I um, I know we've uh, spoken about this before and had some disagreement, so I'll just lay out the case <laughs> briefly, and um, you can you can uh, we can go from there. So, so wild animal suffering uh, is really is really just the the idea that there are animals in the wild that suffer, um, and that's not a that's not a particularly um, surprising claim. Um, animals are sometimes eaten by other animals. They sometimes uh, starve to death or die in the cold or fall down a ravine or um, have some disease and so on. Um, and But re really the claim is here that if if what we value is suffering, uh, sorry, what we disvalue is suffering, what we value is happiness in, in sentient beings, then um, it shouldn't matter that it's not humans causing this suffering in the wild. We should be concerned that there is suffering in the wild and we should, um, if, if possible, if we could do so safely, we should want to reduce that suffering. Now, I will admit that this argument does require, probably require some form of consequentialism uh, ethics to to appreciate and to even consider being worried about. If you approach this from a deontological point of view, you might not be so worried because the suffering in the wild is not directly influenced by uh, humans. We're specifically talking about wild suffering not influenced by humans. But uh, and that's not to say that a utilitarian will necessarily think this is a problem, just that um, you probably would have to be utilitarian to, to consider it as a problem. Um, but just so to break this down uh, as to really how this, the fundamentals of how this works, in terms of reproduction strategy, there are two strategies that are prevalent. There is uh, there's case selected and R selected. Now, case selected is the strategy of giving birth to relatively few young, for example, a human or a giraffe. Um, and then to spend a lot of time caring for each one individually and to ensure that enough survive to um, to propagate your genes. R selected, on the other hand, is where you give birth to um, many more young, perhaps dozens or hundreds or even thousands, for example, fish, rodents, insects, um, To and, the, and then you spend relatively little time caring for each one, but you've given birth to so many that enough, at least two will survive onto adulthood on average to um, propagate the gene. Or the species. For our selected uh, animals, I mean, if if you give birth to thousands of young, like uh, or hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of young, like a fish might, um, on average, only two of these are going to reach adulthood. So the majority of these are going to die at young. They're probably going to die painfully. Um, you might assume, and I mean, even the ones that survive are still living um, lives that have some pain in them. So. Um, when we think about the wild, we often think about relatively happy animals like elephants and giraffes and lions and um, so forth. Uh, these are animals that, I mean, and, and gorillas is a, a particularly good example. These are animals that um, they, they are case selected, and uh, they're the, when we think of the wild, that's often the animal, the types of animals that we think of, uh, and they do live relatively happy lives because of their selection, their reproductive strategy. But most animals in the wild, and especially if we consider insects, if you think there's some probability that insects are sentient, um, most animals in the wild are, are selected. And so most animals are experiencing at least some large amount of suffering, or some not small amount of suffering. And um, there's, there's kind of two claims here. There's the softer claim and the, the stronger claim. The softer one is just that there is suffering in the wild, and if we could do something about it safely, as in not negatively um impacting the ecosystem or the environment or life in general. If we could do so safely, we should do something to reduce that suffering because we don't like suffering. We prefer happier lives. Um, stronger claim is that the majority of wild animals um, are actually living lives that are not worth living. They are, they are lives that are more full of suffering than full of happiness and therefore um, on, on balance, they would have been better off not having been born. And so then um, a proponent of this might then say, if we could do so safely, we might be better off um, converting areas of wilderness into areas of not wilderness, or that is to say, areas where animals live into areas where animals don't live, or to some in some way reduce the number of wild animals living in the world. Um, if we if we really think that on average most of them are living lives not worth living, because that would be a way of um, reducing the amount of suffering in the world. So. Um, th those are, I guess, that's the case for wild animal suffering, and those are the two claims. Now, I'll throw it over to you, Rob, and you can talk about um, any any points that you disagree with. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, um, of course, this is just a, a really new area of research, and and I'm I've got to admit I'm willfully ignorant on this one. I, uh, I have I haven't looked at it in in as much depth as I could have. But um, my intuitions really lead me to be a little bit more conservative about this issue, as uh, I think you are. So I think a lot of uh, extra work gets done by the notion of suffering, uh, and I'm I'm not sure we really have. Um, we, I don't think we have the concept of suffering tied down uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a tight enough way yet to talk about whether or not um, wild animals suffer in this uh, way that is so negatively implied by the way that it's used. But so, so why I'm, I'm intuitively uh, led to be more conservative is that I'm quite partial to uh, what's called the replaceability argument. So the replaceability argument... Um, is used in in the context of uh, uh, animal ethics and, and you know uh, as an argument uh, surrounding you know, vegetarianism basically, but I think it has some some relevance here. So what it says is that basically um, uh, what we're concerned about when we're talking about whether or not we should raise livestock animals, for example, to then eat, is um, um, well-being. As you said, like um, the whole problem with factory farming is that we're basically torturing these animals, and it just needlessly increases uh, negative well-being, right? There, there's no well-being in those situations. But the replaceability argument says, well, if you could, in an ideal world, have a happy cow farm, right? It grows out peacefully. It's not artificially inseminated constantly uh, just to pump it for its milk. Uh, it's, it's young, aren't taken away from the cows, uh, so they don't mourn uh, and get upset uh, because of that. They've lived a, a really happy uh, cow life. Basically, the, the additional step, the, the replaceability argument says, is that we really don't have to wait for that cow to die uh, of natural causes um, before we can perhaps uh, kill it and use it for meat because the, the cognitive state space for a cow is much smaller than for a human, for example. So, so what they're saying is that the cow has now... Once it's reached some level of maturity uh, and lived some some years as an adult, perhaps then procreated, it's basically completed uh, what is a generic and full cow life. Uh, there, there are no uh, idiosyncratic um, uh, personality uh, traits, for example. We don't think anyway. This is all very uh, very conjectural at the moment. But you know, each cow is basically replaceable by the next cow. Um, you could swap them in and out for each other quite neatly. Any other cow could do the same job uh, and live the same life trajectory that any other cow could, basically. Whereas you can't do that with humans. Um, the, the, the degrees of freedom uh, implied by our cognitive complexity just opens too many doors. Uh, each time you make a choice, you know that, that you you open one door, two more doors appear, and, and it just you get this combinatorial explosion uh, in in a human life. There are just so many options open, and and little idiosyncratic complexities that we just don't know how to map yet. Um, each brain is so unique um, that if you if you killed me now, uh, and then tried to make a, a new human to then replace me, that new human. Uh, is, it's basically impossible to guarantee that that new, new human would be the same as me or live uh, as happy a life as me. The uniqueness of humans really really makes them irreplaceable. So the, the flow and moral effect from that uh, for, for, thing, for animals like insects uh, is that I don't think um, we can think of them as suffering in this case because their lives, if you think of the, the, all the possible um, state spaces that they can have in their, their, their lives, uh, What's happening now uh, for them and what's being dubbed as suffering isn't actually uh, that far away from the, the peak experiences that they can possibly have. Um, whereas with humans, we're just like nowhere near uh, even, even glimpsing the peak of human experience right now. We're just so much more, um, uh, we have much more complexity than any of these animals could ever have. Uh, and so the, the, the moral worth uh, that's open to us is just so much larger than for these uh, smaller, less complex animals. Mm. There's, a, there's a few things I want to respond to there. So first, um, I guess when you, when you say, when you talk about the replaceability argument in terms of wild animal suffering, um, uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit of a distraction because w what, we're, what we're worried about is not whether they're replaceable, but just whether 
um, there is there is suffering, and we want to try and reduce that suffering and increase the happiness. So, whereas with your so with your happy cow scenario, which I just want to point out, I, um, doesn't actually exist anywhere in the world right now. There's, there's, That's right. Yeah. It's except I mean, ninety nine percent of all animals raised for food in America are raised in factory farms, and the animals raised in uh, non factory farms don't actually live that good a life. But in any case. Um, if that were a possibility, then sure, if animals are living happy lives and you immediately replace that animal with another happy animal, then um, from a utilitarian perspective, like in a simplified scenario, there doesn't seem to be anything um, particularly wrong with that. Um, but with a with a wild animal, if, if we think that they're they're living a life that's not worth living, or even of the soft claim, if they if they if there's some suffering in their life, even if you replace that, say, an insect with another insect straight away, living the same kind of life, um, they're still suffering, and we're not. I mean, I don't think we're worried. About, well, I'm not worried about whether they're replaceable or not. I'm just worried about um, whether there's suffering and uh, how can we can we reduce that suffering. Um, the second the second uh, thing I just want to point out quickly, and then I'll let you respond, um, is I think uh, where you say cows are replaceable and humans are not, I I do think that's a little bit of an arbitrary claim to make. The reason is, um, I mean, in a simplified world. If you if if we if you killed some human who was living like a happy life, um, and immediately replaced them with another human living a happy life, I mean, so I don't think that we should in, inherently value individuality. I think individuality and unique experiences leads to some good outcomes, but not intrinsically so. Uh, and so if you if you can say that you can kill a happy cow and replace it with a happy cow. I, I believe by the same logic, you should be able to say that you can kill a, uh, a happy by your, by that logic, you should be able to say you can kill a happy human and replace it with another happy human. All else being equal, which of course doesn't happen in reality in, in either scenario. But um, if what we can, if what we're concerned with is suffering and well-being, then I think that same logic should apply. So. Yeah. So quickly, uh, uh, I guess the the Caterus Paribus um, plot clause does does all the work for me. I think the uniqueness is what is exactly what breaks the all other things being equal in that scenario, right? So the uniqueness uh, guarantees that uh, you you, uh, you can't uh, replace any individual human with another one. You just never know, given the neural complexity and the uh, the, the the potential complexity between the relations. Uh, that, a, that any individual human can have with its external environment just means that you have no idea if you're going to end up in the same point uh, with the new human. Whereas with a cow, that's just like really easy to guarantee, basically. Their, their degrees of freedom are much shorter and the way that they can interact with their environment are, are much smaller. So, th so that's why uniqueness isn't intrinsically what I'm valuing. It's because uniqueness adds this component that's morally relevant, right? So we, we, we can't know uh, if we're going to get... Uh, a just as happy human hmm. whereas with the with the case of a really really simple animals like bees or ants for example we can basically guarantee that sure to, to be fair though i mean um we we're quite uncertain about the the long-term impacts of a lot of things even the short-term impacts of a lot of things um so it, it's really just what is your taste for uncertainty i mean uh, you could replace a human and get a get a less happy human. You could replace an animal and get a, a more happy animal. And um, I mean, I think I think the, the argument just applies is just perhaps we're we're more uncertain about one than the other. But even when we talk about you know reducing reducing poverty, we're still we're still not sure like what that's actually going to do 100 years, 1,000 years down the track, and whether that's you know that that could end up being uh, a negative thing. And we just don't know. I mean, we're pretty sure it's a positive thing, but. There's still some uncertainty there, and there's uncertainty around every every action, moral action that we that we have to make. Um, so I, I guess I see what you're saying, but um, I, I would uh, I'd still I'd still think that there is there is uncertainty in in each of those scenarios. Right, but I, I would just then quickly add again that it's it's not just the uncertainty, but the the, the unique state space that is then uh, given by the idiosyncratic human that you just don't get with an ant. Um, uh, any one any one ant can do the exact same job as any other ant, whereas you can't do that with humans. Mm. Would, would you agree, though? Uh, just to just to wrap up, because we are unfortunately running out of time. Um, would you would you agree that if there was some safe way to reduce the amount of suffering in the wild? Um, would you agree that that would be a good thing to do? Yes, I'm just not exactly sure what uh, 
that would look like in the case uh, of especially really small and simple creatures like ants or bees. I'm not sure uh, whether they really are suffering uh, because of that limited state space that I think they, they probably exist in. Um, I'm not sure how you could uh, reduce the quote-unquote suffering if they are actually experiencing any at all. For, a, for say, a, um, wild boars or wild, wild kangaroos in the wild, if we could reduce their suffering? Yeah, perhaps. Per- Right, yeah, so perhaps with more complex creatures, there might be really clear-cut cases that we can really see that they're needlessly suffering. And maybe we can intervene in those cases. But, um, yeah, I think the lines get really blurred uh, the, the, the lower down you go. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I think we could probably talk about this and a bunch of other topics for um, for many hours. And maybe I'll get you back in the future for another round to, to hit this or another topic again. But um, for now, we'll wrap up. And um, thank you again, Rob, for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Oh, absolutely, Michael. I could go on for hours. So uh, <laughs> absolutely, invite me back. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Rob. That was my conversation with Rob Varquison. Thank you for listening to the Morality is Hard podcast. This was our first episode, and I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on how you think we can improve the podcast in the future, both in terms of production uh, and also in terms of content and any any suggested future topics or um, interviewees you'd like to see. Uh, so please do um, let me know. You can you can do that via uh, the Morality is Hard Facebook page. That's just Morality is Hard. Or um, you can do so via my personal website, michaeldello.com. I'll also make sure to put up uh, links to the resources that Rob was uh, talking about in the context of uh, digital versus analog computing. I just want to clarify a little bit as well what I said um, about happy cow farms. I know this is a very contentious issue. Uh, So essentially what I said was if um, in a hypothetical scenario there were uh, animals in a farm able to live um, net positive lives such that, you know, there there was more well-being in their life than suffering, um, that from a utilitarian perspective in a simplified scenario – that would not necessarily be a bad thing. What exactly I mean by that, um, I don't believe that is applicable to real life. Uh, I uh, it's a it's a thought experiment, and I think that um, if uh, if if what we value is suffering and well being, and we can game a scenario such that we can actually make the outcome what we want it to be, then it's very easy. But in real life, um, because just the nature, the reality of how animals are raised, uh, even in non-factory farms. Uh, that's just not a very realistic scenario. So I don't want to, um, I, I want to just clarify that I, I don't support um, animal farming in any way. Um, I just, uh, in that um, overly simplified scenario, then there's not anything necessarily wrong with that from a utilitarian perspective. So thanks again for listening and hope you'll tune in next time.